Um, I'm Pamela Nadell, uh, Chair of AU's Department of History and Director of our Jewish Studies Program, and I welcome you to this evening's program on the new book, To the Gates of Jerusalem, The Diaries and Papers of James G. MacDonald, 1945 to 1947. Our program this evening is co-sponsored by our Department of History, our Jewish Studies Program, and our Center for Israel Studies. As always, a very special thank you to Laura Cutler. She's over there by the coffee. Um, she is the center's managing director, and nothing that takes place in the center would happen without Laura. Um, her, she's uh, extraordinary talents make all of this wonderful programming possible. So I'm delighted to welcome you, and I'm going to make some very brief introductions of our panelists and then let them get underway. Um, uh, uh, at the very end of the table, um, on, my, on my left, on your right, is Professor Norman Goda. He is the Norman and Irma Brayman Professor of Holocaust Studies at the University of Florida. His books include Tales from Spandau, Nazi Criminals, and the Cold War, and The Holocaust, Europe, the World, and the Jews. He is also co-authored with Richard Breitman, U.S. Intelligence and the Nazis, and also Hitler's Shadow, Nazi War Criminals, U.S. Intelligence, and the Cold War. His work has been the subject of stories by the New York Times, the Associated Press, U.S. News and World Reports, and other major outlets. He has also served as a consultant to the United States and German governments, as well as for various radio, television programs, and film documentaries. My colleague Richard Brightman, in the middle, is the author or co-author of 11 books and many articles in German history, U.S. history, and the history of the Holocaust. His books, The Architect of Genocide, Himmler and the Final Solution, and Official Secrets, What the Nazis Planned, What the British and Americans Knew, were translated into five foreign languages. His 2013 book, FDR and the Jews, co-authored with our colleague Alan Lichtman, won the National Jewish Book Award in American Jewish Studies and was a finalist for the last Los Angeles Times Book Prize in History. Professor Brightman is Distinguished Professor at American University and also editor of the journal Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, professors Goda and Brightman will be discussing their new um, co-edited book this evening, and the program will be moderated by our colleague, Professor Michael Brenner. Professor Brenner is the Seymour and Lillian Abenson Chair in Israel Studies and Director of AU's Center for Israel Studies. He is also Professor of Jewish History and Culture at the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. The author or editor of more than 25 books, many of which have appeared in translations in at least 10 different languages. His books include A Short History of the Jews, Zionism, A Brief History, and After the Holocaust, Rebuilding Jewish Lives in Postwar Germany. He is the international president of the Leo Beck Institute and was most recently awarded the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany for his extraordinary contributions to advancing the study of Jewish civilization there. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Okay, I'd like to welcome all of you. Thank you, Pam, for the generous introduction. I'd like to welcome the audience, I'd like to welcome the speakers, and uh, without much further ado, I think what we'll do is to give each speaker 15 minutes of introduction of the topic um, of the book, and afterwards I'll ask a few questions here and then we'll open it up to the audience. So Richard, you go first. I'd like to add my thanks to Laura and uh, Pam and Michael for agreeing to do this, and thank you all for coming out. Imagine the time just before there was a state of Israel. I'm looking around and I say, oh yeah, you all have to imagine that time. Um, <laughs> Suppose I tell you that this book is a diary, a diary account of a committee of which few of you have ever heard. 
after much time and trouble, the committee in 1946 came up with a compromise report regarding displaced persons in Europe and Palestine that one of the sponsors of the committee quickly rejected. Events in 1947 and 1948 overtook the committee's report, and as a result, the committee is mostly forgotten. Norm and I would like to persuade you that you should be interested in this committee. Tough task? Well, let's see. Let's start by recasting the story of this committee. If you're interested in the relationship between survivors of the Holocaust and what became the state of Israel, this diary is highly relevant. If you're interested in the attitudes of Britain and the United States toward what became the state of Israel and really the, the connection, their attitudes towards the Holocaust and how it fed into um, the situation in Palestine, this diary is even more relevant. You don't have to take my word for it. Let's listen in on excerpts from a conversation on October 22nd, 1945, between Sec American Secretary of State James Burns and British Ambassador Lord Halifax. The situation just before that conversation was that the British Foreign Secretary, Ernst Bevan, had just proposed the establishment of a British American committee to study the problems of European Jewry. It wasn't quite cast in the Nazi style language, the Jewish problem, but it was in effect the Jewish problem. All right, I'm gonna read excerpts. Lord Halifax, you see today is Monday and Bevan has to know. I'd like to be able to tell him today or tomorrow what your judgment is. Burns, I'm going to think that one over this evening. I'm not clear, but I think if the terms of reference were different, that the president, Truman, could agree to it. But the terms of reference as set out do not even mention Palestine. Halifax, I know exactly what he, Bevan, has in mind. I am sure that in his mind is a desire to put up a flag and say, all you people who say that the only remedy for the Jews is Palestine, you put your head in a bag. It is not true, and we, want, we are going to look into all possibilities. A great many will want to go back to their homes. Europe, or the United States, or to Palestine, but for heaven's sake, stop saying Palestine is the only solution. Burns, I imagine that was it, and of course that is just what the Jews over here in the US are interested in. They're not interested in the plight of Jews in Europe. What they're interested in is they believe they ought to have a country of their own. Halifax, that's all they're thinking of. All he, Bevan, is saying is let's find out from the Jews if they want to settle in France or Romania and if they want to stay there, that's all right. Burns, we believe that this thing should be settled through a trusteeship in the United Nations and that pending settlement by the United Nations there should be a joint Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry 
as a matter of urgency. Halifax. I should think that it might be possible for him, Bevan, to have a more specific reference to Palestine if it would help you, provided you don't put him into a position of accepting a Hitler thesis that there is no room for the Jews in Europe. So this committee became the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry regarding the problems of European Jewry and Palestine. Uh, full disclosure, uh, we found this document, the conversation, only after uh, we completed this volume. It was part of our research for volume four. So you won't read that in this particular book. However, um, that does uh, prompt me to say that this book is somewhere between 80% and 90% diary. And the rest of it is our introduction, our conclusion, and our additional research, which we've separated uh, out by putting it in italics um, so that you can tell what is diary and what is not diary, and the additional research uh, kind of fills in things that the diary doesn't fully explain. So back to the committee. Twelve men, they were all men, um, six Brits, six Americans, um, a range of political views, but McDonald, James G. McDonald, was nominated by uh, at least one of Truman's advisors and imposed on the State Department. They were aghast when they learned that McDonald had been named to the committee. Who was James G. McDonald? Uh, maybe a few of you know, uh, but I'll give you the basics. So, uh, McDonald, born in Ohio, raised in Indiana, uh, went to Indiana University, did some graduate work at Harvard, never got his PhD, um, became head of something called the Foreign Policy Association, which still exists, and uh, from there uh, managed in 1933 to get an appointment as League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, unfortunately, neither the League of Nations nor any of the uh, other major governments wanted to support his efforts to get Jews out of Germany and resettled elsewhere. He resigned in protest. He later became chairman of President Roosevelt's Advisory Committee on Political Refugees, which um, he continued to do part-time until the end of World War II. After the war, he was kind of looking for something new to do, and this offer to join this committee uh, was to him something to pursue uh, work that he had long uh, been interested in and to uh, perhaps make up for some earlier uh, failures. Where did the committee go? Well, it started in Washington. It held hearings. It went to London and held hearings. The committee then went to the continent and split up. Some members went to France and to Switzerland, as McDonald did. Others went uh, to zones of occupied Germany and to Austria, some as far as Poland. They talked to Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. They talked to Jewish community leaders. They found overwhelming sentiment for resettlement in Palestine. Even the Brits, who didn't want to hear this particular message, conceded that this is what younger Jews seem to want. Some British members of the committee argued 
that Jews were fleeing post-war Poland because they were by nature migrants, incapable of growing deep roots anywhere. Others felt that the Soviet Union was manipulating the flight of Jews from Eastern Europe to Western Europe in order to insert among them communist agents. One British representative suggested sur settling surviving Polish Jews in Poland's newly acquired province of Silesia, which was literally in the shadow of Auschwitz, rather than in Palestine. From Europe, the committee went to Palestine. Well, they went first to Cairo, but uh, once they got to Palestine, they marveled at Jewish achievements there. And this brought at least some of the Brits closer to American views about immigration to Palestine. I mentioned Cairo. In closed military hearings in Cairo, British military authorities blamed the Jewish agency for Palestine for rejecting British immigration restrictions and fostering violence in Palestine. The Jews, they said, not the Arabs, were the source of all disorder. If no compromise could be found, the British military preferred a solution favorable to the Arabs because it would create fewer difficulties for the Brits. If there was trouble in Palestine, they could handle it. A pro-Arab report would cause trouble in pa Palestine. If there was a pro-Jewish report, there would be trouble a lot of places in the Middle East. When one American member asked what would happen if the British simply withdrew from Palestine, Major General Oliver said, the Jews might hold their own at first, but if the Arabs got together, they would exterminate the Jews. The commander of British forces in Palestine similarly forecast that unless the Jews could get arms from the outside, the Arabs would push all of them into the sea. I mention these um, comments, this testimony, in part because it was hanging in the air. And uh, I think we will argue tonight that this became a threat within the committee and a kind of fallback strategy for the British government. Let me jump to the report. They, after touring Egypt, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, part of the committee went to Saudi Arabia and listening to Arab governments, they went to Switzerland they fought, they finally came up with a compromise that called for the entrance of 100,000 Jews into Palestine quickly. MacDonald was instrumental in getting that into the report. They said it was too early to determine the ultimate political structure of Palestine, but there, in the meantime, there should be a trusteeship uh, by the United Nations. Before the committee report was published, President Truman announced that he was accepting the committee report. The British government was not consulted. Britain was trying to get American backing for its policy. They had a problem. They couldn't openly reject the report and hold on to American backing. So they said, well, this is a complicated report. We need another committee to determine how to implement it. It was later called the Morrison-Grady Committee. The Morrison-Grady Committee had a very different composition. 
and came to entirely different conclusions. Those conclusions leaked. As they began to leak out, McDonald, together with the two senators from New York State, met with President Truman in the White House on January 27, 1946. Truman tried to parry them by saying, hey, the plan is not finished yet. But McDonald would have none of it. He said the basic principles were clear and they were anathema. McDonald said, you have been badly served. The diary ended before this meeting, but we have this account from McDonald's papers and some other sources. Truman was angry and combative Hell, you can't satisfy these people. The Jews aren't going to write the history of the United States or my history. But in the end, he agreed with McDonald that maybe he didn't have the right people to carry through his ideas. Three days after that meeting, Truman definitively rejected the Morrison-Grady plan and recalled the American diplomats from London. In October 1946, Truman publicly announced that immigration to Palestine could not wait for a general solution. It should begin immediately. That was the definitive end of any possibility that Britain would sway American government views on Palestine policy. In February 1947, Foreign Secretary Bevin, unable to get his own cabinet to agree on a single plan, turned the issue over to the United Nations, which, as you all know, later recommended partition. And initial implementation of that plan brought Israeli independence and war in 1948. Um, I'm going to conclude by mentioning the fact, this is, again is not in the book, but uh, in the last couple of months, there have been a number of press reports uh, based on French intelligence documents that Britain in 1947, 1948, pursued a two-track strategy. On the surface, the British government supported United Nations efforts to bring about partition, and that meant a Jewish state. In the Middle East itself, British intelligence operatives encouraged the Arab states to attack Israel and to do what the British military thought was likely and most likely to benefit uh, the interests of the British Empire. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for uh, giving us some taste already of the diaries and the book. And I ask um, Professor Goda to follow up for another 15-minute introduction, his part. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Somewhat limited in range uh, this evening, physically and perhaps intellectually, but I'll do my best. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Pam Nadell um, and Laura Cutler as well for inviting me and setting up this event. I'm a native Washingtonian, and it's always special to come here, um, uh, particularly to AU. Um, Richard and I have worked on a number of things in the last 15 years, and it's, it's always been a tremendous experience for me. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Michael Brenner as well, whose work um, I've admired for some time, but I only met him this evening. The persistence of the Arab-Israeli conflict has spawned a recent literature that some of you may know, arguing that the Zionist enterprise was a poisoned chalice from its beginnings imperialistic, militaristic, even genocidal. David, in other words, did not become Goliath in 1967. He was Goliath all along. 
American Jews, meanwhile, according to this literature, were complicit, manipulating the US government and rejecting perfectly reasonable schemes whereby Arabs and Jews might have shared Palestine in a binational state. To right these wrongs, some say, narratives must change, resolutions must pass, boycotts must be imposed, Palestine must be liberated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Discourse uh, for many years has become something of a weapon. Um, McDonald's diary from the Anglo-American Committee on Palestine informs the origins of some of this discourse, and it's this that I want to focus on in my time. The British, as you just heard, created the committee in 1945 to hear testimony and make binding recommendations to London and Washington, but London expected from the very beginning that certain conclusions would be reached. One, Jewish refugees in Europe could stay in Europe, and in fact, they could go back to Poland and, and live happily ever after. Two, Jewish refugees did not really want to go to Palestine, rather they were being manipulated by Zionist agents. Three, Zionism itself was aggressive, um, indoctrinating the young into a national cult. Four, Arab objections were not based on anti-Semitism at all, but rather a very principled anti-imperialism. The British had to do some handsprings with that. And, and five, geopolitical disaster would result if Zionism had its way. Um, the Arab world would then turn away from um, sort of an imagined friendship that it had with the West. And faced with these arguments, how could the committee ever recommend additional Jewish immigration, much less a Jewish state. MacDonald understood a few things about this committee. And, and keep in mind, there had been many, many committees about Palestine before, um, but, but this one was different. First, it was the first such committee uh, that was convened after the Holocaust itself. Um, second, it was the first such committee that met uh, at the beginning of what would become Britain's uh, rapidly accelerating process of decolonization. Um, and three, of course, it was the first such committee that really included the Americans in an integral way. Um, and so MacDonald understood uh, that, that this work would be the bedrock, or at least he expected that this work, uh, the recommendations um, would be the bedrock um, of future global policy, but he also came to understand uh, throughout the hearings uh, that discourse um, concerning Zionism was, was very important because the British hoped in these committee meetings to completely delegitimize Zionism itself. And MacDonald really fought against this and I, and I would argue was successful um, in at least insofar as the report was concerned. I'll give a few examples. First, British colonial officers testified in many places as we have just heard, in, in London, in Cairo, uh, in Jerusalem itself, uh, in order to safeguard uh, the British geopolitical position in the Middle East. And they tended to link Zionism with what had become uh, a very discredited uh, European nationalism following World War II. Jews, they testified, were responsible for the turmoil in Palestine because Zionism itself was fundamentally expansionist. In London, uh, there was a general by the name of Sir Edward Spears who had served uh, as, a, as a British military um, mission officer in Damascus and Beirut as the French were being kicked out. Um, and he argued the following, and I quote, Zionist policy in Palestine has many similar features to Nazi philosophy, including the Nazi idea of Lebensraum. Um, MacDonald immediately challenged this, and, and he said, and I quote, I was surprised, MacDonald was a very polite man, 
that we, we have to um, sort of keep this in mind. Um, but McDonald's repost was, I was surprised and somewhat shocked at the general's characterization of Nazis as marked by Zionist tendencies. Having known something about the Nazis in firsthand experience and having dealt with their victims over a considerable, a considerable period, I wonder if the general didn't really mean that there are few Zionists, very, very few, whom one could characterize this way, if at all. And, and this was not an atypical exchange. Um, it happened several times in London, it happened several times in Cairo, it happened several times um, in Jerusalem as well. Secondly, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Arab testimony tried to walk that fine line that we have witnessed um, over the past few years between anti Zionism on the one hand and anti-Semitism on the other. But they often tripped over the fine line. Uh, Arab notables testified in Washington, in London, Jerusalem, in the Arab capitals, uh, many at their own behest, many at the behest of the British authorities. Arab witnesses included royalty, cabinet members, religious leaders, and academics. McDonald noted their very frank anti-Semitism, often tarted up as anti-imperialism. And to the extent that Arab speakers acknowledged the Holocaust, they noted, as one speaker argued, and I quote, it is for the Jews to change themselves, to change contentions which they hold that make them offensive wherever they are, unquote. One Arab scholar likened Zionism to the plague and the measles. Others lamented Jewish control of everything from Wall Street to the American press. After meeting with Lebanese cabinet members in Beirut, McDonald noted in his diary, and I quote, the discussion was animated. The opinions expressed were strongly, sometimes almost violently anti-Zionist and even anti-Jewish. One of the ministers in particular repeated some of the most fantastic of the Hitler charges against the Jews, unquote. McDonald was especially dismayed by the way Arab speakers praised Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. The Mufti, for those who do not know, was a lightning rod. Having led a revolt against the British in Palestine in 1936, he had lived in exile since 1937, and he spent the war years hobnobbing in Berlin with Hitler, Himmler, and Eichmann and broadcasting messages to the Middle East for Arabs to rise up and kill the Jews living there, not just in Palestine, but um, in Cairo and elsewhere. Living in Paris after the war, the Mufti did not go to Jerusalem to testify, but he was there in spirit. Among his backers were Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, who testified, and I quote, this commission has heard the statements of several Zionists, but has not heard the statement of the one man who more than anyone else is entitled to speak for Palestine, namely the Mufti of Jerusalem. Now, McDonald pressed hard on a few issues here. One, and this is still an issue that sort of confounds historians today, did the Mufti really speak for Palestine's Arabs? And what he heard again and again and again was that insofar as it could be told that this was indeed the case. In Damascus, uh, the Syrian president told him that the Arab higher committee, the Mufti's creation, did indeed represent the Arabs. Even the Mufti's opponents in Palestine, one of whom uh, McDonald met with secretly from the Nashashibi clan, which was uh, a blood enemy of the Husseini clan, argued um, that unfortunately good things had to be said about the Mufti in the committee because this was expected um, by the mass. Um, uh, it was the Mufti's kinsman, Jamal al-Husseini, uh, on the Arab Higher Committee, who testified most clearly. When McDonald asked Jamal al-Husseini, 
what are your plans? What are the Arab Higher Committee's plans to uh, deal with Palestine should the British leave? Uh, Jamal al-Husseini said, and I quote, in a few months, things will be much better. And we shall return with the Jews merely to the same conditions that existed before the Great War. Um, anyone with a calendar would know um, that that me meant that every Jew who had arrived since the Balfour Declaration, about 480,000 by that point, um, would simply be driven out. Three, Jewish witnesses were discursively attacked. The list of Jews who testified in Washington, London, Europe, and Jerusalem was an absolute who's who. Uh, of Jewish leaders, uh, Zionist leaders, um, uh, Holocaust rescuers, um, resistors um, from France and elsewhere, I, I could go on and on. Um, but the British committee members constantly challenged them. It simply would not do, according to the British, to whine about the meaning of the Balfour Declaration or the recent murder of the Jews in Europe, which the British argued was simply neither here nor there. Jewish witnesses had to show how more Jews in Palestine would not result in chaos. Now in this context, MacDonald sought additional information to disprove a key British argument that Zionism was a dangerous national cult. In Europe, MacDonald made it a point to hear from Jewish wartime leaders, from communist resistor Adam Reisky in France to the Italian Jewish uh, rescuer Raphael Cantoni, um, to uh, Lev Garfunkel, who was a former member of the Jewish Council in Kovno. None of them were Zionists before the war, but all called for a Jewish state in Palestine. He also visited Jewish DP camps that were far off the beaten path, some of which had, had you know, 200, 300 Jews in them, near Lake Constance. He visited a small group of Orthodox Jews who had never been Zionists before the war. There, MacDonald wrote in his diary, we sat around the table and listened to the rabbi's eloquent denunciations of the British and his passionate pleas for American help in establishing a Jewish state. In MacDonald, uh, I'm sorry, in Palestine, MacDonald toured Jewish settlements, seeing everything from vineyards to nurseries. And aside from hearing the testimony of Jewish agency leaders, he met with them privately. He was very impressed with the economic arguments that Palestine could support a far larger population with uh, proper development, with the reams of statistics that showed that the Arab life expectancy had dramatically increased. He was struck by the sincerity of Zionist arguments made repeatedly by David Ben-Gurion uh, privately and, and others that Jewish Arab enmity, according to Ben-Gurion, and I'm quoting, was, quote, a passing thing, unquote, and Ben-Gurion's private comment that, quote, only the Jews could win the confidence of the Arabs and thus stabilize that part of the world. MacDonald wasn't benighted. He knew that Palestine was an armed camp in 1946, and he knew that disaster was some sort of a possibility. But in the end, he also believed, as he wrote in 1947, and I quote, it will not take too long after a Jewish state in Palestine has been established before the young and progressive Arab intelligentsia, which is bound to arise, will join hands with Palestine Jewry for the common good of the Middle East, so unwelcome to the Muslim potentates and clergy, unquote. This explanation or this expectation seems very optimistic now, but it was also shared by many Zionist leaders, American intellectuals, and, and even moderate Arabs. In April 1946, the committee wrote its recommendations. Uh, none saved MacDonald, uh, advocated a Jewish state, but as we've heard, the U.S. members insisted that 100,000 Jews be allowed to move to Palestine, as Truman has er had earlier advocated. To preserve amity with the United States, the British agreed with this. But uh, in the report, the British tried to create several outs. Um, chief among them was the continued discrediting of Zionism as communistic, nationalistic, and terroristic all at once. MacDonald objected to all of these characterizations in the report. I'll read some of his comments uh, during the argument here. Um, on the part of the report having to do with the economy that argued that the Jews were a bunch of communists, um, 
McDonald wrote, the phrase superimposed Jewish economy seems out of place if Jewish development is to be accepted, as I believe it must be, as an essential or even a decisive element in the country's economy. The reference to a facade of private enterprise does not accord with the facts as known to me. I believe that some 90% of Jewish industry and most of the commerce is entirely private. On cooperation with the Arabs, McDonald wrote, the implication in the draft that um, Hashomer Hatzair pleads for cooperation with the Arabs is that other Jewish bodies are not in favor of such cooperation. This is incorrect. These groups are no less strongly in favor of cooperation with the Arabs and have taken steps toward that end. The teaching of Arabic is increasingly fostered in all Jewish secondary schools. On what was called often the Arab inability to make their case heard, MacDonald wrote, in view of the well-financed and well-staffed propaganda which the Arabs have today established in Washington, New York, and London, this statement no longer holds true. Moreover, the Arabs have very special opportunities of presenting their case which are not open to the Jews by reason of the existence of legations in the main Arab capitals. These delegations, in fact, act also as the direct mouthpiece for the Palestinian Arab case. And as for the assertion that the Jewish agency exercised totalitarian tendencies over the Jewish population in Palestine, McDonald objected as follows. This statement is unfair and untrue. It is impossible to uphold such an allegation in light of the multiplicity of political parties and the variety and often conflicting points of view in the Hebrew press. The statement would be bitterly resented and with justification. The report didn't advocate a Jewish state but it did call for an end to British immigration restrictions and it omitted all of the language delegitimizing Zionism. As MacDonald told Ben-Gurion later, it was a big step. And as he later insisted to Truman, as you heard, the step having been taken could not be reversed. The hysterics with which the Arab world greeted the report reflected MacDonald's efforts. Abdel Rahman Azam Pasha, the Secretary General of the Arab League, smelled a Jewish conspiracy in a New York hotel room. Syrian President Shukri al Kwatli jumped the line between anti Semitism and anti Zionism, privately raving to a U.S. diplomat as follows We fear the great influence wielded by Jews everywhere, notably in the United States. Can you not see that while Muslims and Christians can work together, it is abnormal that either should make common cause with the Jews. They have always been troublemakers. Our Quran inveighs against them specifically." Unquote. MacDonald could not stem such discourse in Damascus, Cairo, or Baghdad, but he kept it from spreading in Washington. That he kept it from spreading from Washington was important because the struggle over language eventually helped with the US dis UN decision to partition Palestine and the relationship with Israel that followed. We should not underestimate the importance of discourse, especially since it has assumed such an important role in our own time. And if MacDonald were alive today, I suspect that he would be at the forefront of separating the historical from the ahistorical, documented truth from conspiracy theories, all while reminding us of the geopolitical dangers represented by vacuous argument. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Norm and Richard. Um, let me say before I ask the first question, when you have the book in your hands, the, the cover says the diary, the subtitle says the diaries and papers of James G. MacDonald, and it sounds like maybe some dry diary, you, uh, with some comments and footnotes, but it's really not. Uh, if you read the book, uh, first of all, you will see a lot of excerpts from some of the leading minds of the time, not just politicians like Weizmann, Ben Gurion, of course, Americans and British politicians, but also Einstein, who testifies, and other figures of religious and cultural significance, Rabbi Stephen Wise, and many others who appear here. The book is also, in a way, a, a travelogue. It's, it's really a history, very fascinating cultural history of traveling the way they travel from the United States to England, and they are kind of shocked because they are put into these 
into the main deck with 12 bunk beds with bunk beds with 12 for 12 people in the room and they they the, the, the british it's on the queen elizabeth right then and, and the british uh, apologize and and then you s you have the travel from egypt to jerusalem in the train and it's it's really fascinating to read not just in terms of the testimonies and of the diaries but it is a a in in many ways a political and a cultural history of the time and it's a time when you also um, and, and, and both of the speakers alluded to it, you have hundreds of thousands of Jewish survivors in Europe um, who do not want to go back to Eastern Europe. Um, pogroms, uh, already in 1945, you have pogroms in Poland, and, and of course they spread through 1946, and you have um, DP camps, displaced persons camps all over Germany and Italy and Austria, and 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 as the title page already shows, they are really waiting to come to Palestine, the future state of Israel. And the last point, and I think that became very clear, especially in Norman's uh, talk before, the anti-Semitism, which still, which which really did not disappear after 1945. And you hear it not only in Eastern Europe, but some of the quotes from uh, the politicians you. You mentioned a few of the British um, voices here, but even among the Americans, if you think of General Patton in, in Germany, um, there was still uh, quite some clear and unambiguous anti-Semitism around right after the Holocaust. So my first question is just a little bit about the, the committee. It was six British members and six American members, and my question is, was it clear that the British had one kind of attitude and the Americans another one? Or did you see, I mean, as I alluded, someone like Patton had clearly anti-Jewish views in Germany, was not on the committee, of course. Um, but can you see British voices in the committee which were more pro-Jewish or pro-Zionist and, and Americans who were not? Or was there a clear American versus British attitude? Um, I'll start that one anyway if you want to add that's fine uh, the um, British delegation was not um, uniform but uh, most of the people were um, both loyal uh, to the British government and acceptable to the British Foreign Office the American delegation was more diverse uh, and that largely came about because Truman and Truman's advisors decided not to simply accept the State Department's nominees. And as I think I indicated, uh, McDonald's name showed up late and uh, was unexpected to the State Department as well as the British. And uh, there were people who were aghast and uh, we had one document saying, well, um, Mr. McDonald's uh, presence is unfortunate, but uh, the Americans, the State Department seems to uh, indicate that the presence of Mr. Phillips kind of cancels out McDonald because Phillips is way on the other side. So it really won't matter. The, uh, the British weren't uniform. Um, there were a couple of conservatives and um, a number of laborites, but they were all uniform in their understanding of the geopolitical realities that the British had in the Middle East, whereas the Americans were less so. Um, when the British looked at Palestine, they thought about uh, the Suez Canal, the pivot of their empire in Egypt, the naval base at Alexandria, um, the two air bases in Iraq, the uh, oil pipeline that ran from Iraq to Haifa, where the British owned one of the most important refineries in the world, the British refineries in Iran, uh, and the turmoil in India that was brewing between Muslims uh, and uh, Hindus. And uh, from the British point of view, 
uh, the needs of a few Jews in Europe simply did not add up to keeping all of that intact, especially since negotiations with the Egyptians over um, the continued British presence in the Canal Zone um, and Alexandria were, were not going well and, and would continue um, not to go particularly well. And if the British couldn't stay in um, Alexandria, then they thought that Gaza um, would be a good substitute base for that. And so um, a, a lot of this is what's driving British policy. The Labor Party had supported um, more Jewish emigration, but from the moment they got into power, they were quickly educated by the foreign office and the military that you simply could not have the entire Arab world go up in flames um, over this. It would cripple the British um, imperial position. The, the Americans um, simply did not view the world in, in these geopolitical terms. The State Department certainly did. Um, you know, they could not imagine breaking with the British over anything, um, especially something where the British had more expertise. Um, and, and the State Department did manage, as, as Richard just said, to put some of their people on the committee. Um, unfortunately, uh, a few people who the State Department didn't want, like MacDonald and, and a couple of others, um, uh, were, were put on by the White House. Um, and, and so this made for interesting discussions, and, and the book documents how these discussions stayed polite in London, how they became more heated in Vienna, and how it became an all-out slugfest uh, to the point where they were barely talking to each other by the time the report was finally written um, in Switzerland. And, and in fact, uh, London's reaction to this report <laughs> How the hell did this happen? A hundred thousand Jews? You, you know, we had this thing fixed. Um, London's reaction is is just wonder. It was it was it's wonderful to read about. Yeah, from from the interest point of view. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe Macdonald's role, if you were to summarize it briefly? I mean, he barely got in the in the group. In the end, he, he seemed, I mean, of course, he is also the person you have most documents of, but what, how, was he able to influence some of the other members uh, decisively? Did he change some other people's views? In political terms, um, probably the most important person on the committee was a, a Texas judge named Hutchison, uh, who was the American chair, and um, McDonald knew a lot more about the subject and the uh, geopolitics than Hutchison did. And so part of what is happening is McDonald working on all of the members of the committee, but especially on Hutchison, trying to educate him, uh, despairing when Hutchison doesn't learn very quickly things or reverts to earlier uh, anti-Zionist views and kind of finally winning Hutchison over. Hutchison uh, kind of um, swayed some of the uncertain uh, American members and then from there was a question of picking the Brits off one by one, never really getting the, uh, the diehards, but the diehards finally realized it would be ridiculous to issue a report with a 10-2 uh, margin. They were supposed to try for a unanimous report, um, and so uh, they had a unanimous report, and then one of the diehards tried uh, through uh, inserting a, uh, a spoiler amendment to basically nullify the effect of the report, and even his own countrymen got mad at him at that point because they had been fighting for so long. So. McDonald, uh, I, I won't say he was completely consistent. He had his own um, uh, vacillations on certain issues, but he was the one person from the beginning who was basically pro-Zionist. Uh, he wasn't going to push for a report favoring a Jewish state, but he certainly was going to push for a report from the beginning that um, endorsed major Jewish immigration to Palestine. 
What McDonald could do too that the others could not was this. Um, he knew many of these Jewish leaders from the 1930s. Uh, the British really did not. Um, and so he could meet uh, quietly uh, with people like uh, Moshe Shertok, who later became Israel's first foreign minister, uh, Nahum Goldman, um, and others. And uh, they, they talked about things like, well, would you rather have um, a minority report that gives you everything that you want or a unanimous report that gives you half a loaf? They talked about things like partition. Um, even in 1946, the problem was, you know, no one knew what partition was going to look like. Um, it might well have looked like it looked in 1937, which um, was not a particularly good deal uh, for um, anyone who wanted to create a real Jewish state. Um, and so, and so, McDonald could ha had those kinds of um, connections. <coughs> that the others uh, really didn't have. Um, the other thing that was very difficult, different about MacDonald is after this report was published, um, many of the members just sort of went back to whatever their lives were before. Uh, MacDonald distributed all of the copies that he was given, then he asked for more copies and he distributed those, and he was going to make sure um, that these recommendations were implemented. And, and it was uh, he uh, who managed, there's a long story behind it, that he even managed to get into the White House on a Saturday of all things um, and tell Truman, not as it has been argued by some, um, that uh, the, the Jews were going to get him, um, but rather that his own people from the State Department were messing up this report. And, and, and so that, that's one thing that was different about him as well. Let me ask one more question and we open it up. It is striking, I think, for everyone who reads it, we are in 1946, we're in 1947, and the idea of the Jewish state is really kind of still very unclear among not just the members of the committee, but among most of the people involved in the discussions here. What was, in your view, crucial when you read the document? I think that comes here in the next book project is already part of it, which, which expands to the early 50s when MacDonald then became the first ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador to Israel. What is it that, in your view, in 1947, um, really changed things so dramatically that while in 1946, 100,000 Jews able to emigrate to, to Palestine was such a provocation, it changed to become a partition claim of the Jewish state. What, what, what were the developments you found mo most crucial in this time? Um, the the um, the most important development, I think, was that the British had simply run out of outs. Um, they, had, they had simply run out of plans. Um, they kept trying to come up with a plan that would mollify the Arabs uh, while leaving Jews in Palestine in place, um, and they simply could not do this. Um, the uh, Jewish agency, which the British were forced to keep, um, kept saying, look, the nub of this issue is immigration. We have got to be able to control or at least influence immigration. The Arab leadership kept saying, not only not one more Jew, but every Jew who's come since 1917 has to hightail it out of here. Um, it, it, you know, Bevan was a uh, labor union leader. That's where he made his bones, and, and he figured, uh, and, you know, I, I don't really study Bevan, but um, um, he figured, uh, you know, <laughs> if I can bring labor and management together in Britain, I can do anything. Well, you know, this he, he simply could not do, and, and so the British kind of punted. But um, as Richard pointed out, these intelligence documents are very, very interesting because the British behavior um, after uh, war breaks out, I don't want to give away the ghost of the next book, but the British behavior after, after the war breaks out in 1948 is very, very interesting. They, they do not 
uh, recognize Israel with open arms. Let's just let's just leave it at that. Okay, we'll open it up, and maybe everyone could just introduce him or herself briefly before you ask a question, please. And the m there's mics coming in a second. Uh, my name is Ira Weiss. I'm representing no one. Um, you mentioned that Truman's response to uh, his, the presentation of the uh, committee report to him uh, and the recommendation that 100,000 Jews be allowed to immigrate uh, quickly was negative, and he, he reacted, he said, uh, I'm not going to let the Jews determine what uh, American policy is going to be uh, or my legacy will be. And then within a few days, he turned around and screwed Bevin. What caused that to happen? Okay, first let me clear something up. There were basically two committee reports. The committee that McDonald served on, Truman, Truman accepted that report. Truman liked that report because he liked the idea of 100,000 uh, Jewish D DPs going to Palestine quickly. That's what he thought should happen. It was the subsequent committee, the Morrison-Grady Committee, uh, which issued or was about to issue a different report undermining the Anglo-American Committee report. That was the one that leaked and when McDonald saw what that was all about, that was when he got in to see Truman and let him have it. And uh, I, I mean, uh, it, it took a number of uh, hours and perhaps a day or so of thought, but Truman sent Secretary of State Burns to fly to London to talk to the British government and the American ne State Department uh, negotiators there, and when he couldn't quickly get agreement, um, he said, let's go home. And that's when the chance of a British uh, pro-Arab solution that with American support vanished. And it, it was Truman thinking over what McDonald had said and not quite trusting the State Department experts and making a judgment. Hi, Bob Lerman, Economics here at AU. Um, Winston Churchill was a very strong uh, Zionist, uh, at least until Lord Moyne got assassinated. But why didn't he figure a little bit in the debate at all? I mean, he, wa he got beat. Obviously, he wasn't uh, elected, but he still must have been a somewhat powerful voice. And um, were there no real voices um, that were more sympathetic to the Jews and Zionism um, in Britain? I mean, he was certainly one for a period of time. You want me to take that, or you want? I can I can start it and. Um, well, Churchill's, Churchill's Zionism during the war um, might be a little suspect. Um, he upheld the white paper throughout, and in fact, the certificates um, that were even allowed were, were never issued um, over the course of the war. After the war, the worse things got for Bevan, the more Churchill piped up, you know, um, that, Pevin, that Bevan was making a complete mess of Palestine um, that something had to be done um, for the Jews, uh, that, that uh, things were working fine until, until Bevan and Attlee took control and, and, and these sorts of things. I, I think it was partly um, Churchill sentiments, but partly um, you know, uh, doing what you do to the Labor Party when the Labor Party um, is in power. The other interesting point is this. Um, Britain did not have the Jewish Zionists that the United States had. You know, they they didn't have uh, the Wises, the Silvers, the Neumanns, um, uh, and so forth. They 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 did have um, the Simon Marxes and the Sidney Silvermans and that sort of thing. Um, it was considered bad form in Washington to attack. Uh, 
the American Zionists in the committee. The, Brit the British do it from time to time. They know not to mess with Wise because he was in his 70s and stuff like that. But man, did they have at the uh, British Zionist leaders when they testified in London, um, particularly Simon Marks. And, uh, uh, but they gave as good as they got. It, it's interesting. The British um, at one point said, or the British um, committee members at one point said to Marks, if you people start a war in Palestine, you know, because you want more immigrants there, and this starts a war there, um, do you think that your fate will be better than the last war? And Marx gives this wonderful answer. How could it be worse, you know? Um, and, and so those exchanges are, uh, are very interesting, but they, they kind of remind us that Zionism was never really the force in Britain. Um, that it was in the United States, and, and this sort of informed British attitudes as well. I think Norm also answered the question earlier to some degree that the um, th there was so much attachment in both parties to the interests of the British Empire, and there was very little way to um, square a pro-Jewish report or even a 50-50 compromise with the interests of the British Empire um, that uh, it just didn't have a lot of uh, purchase uh, in Britain. Whereas in the United States, there were people who said, look, this is a difficult issue and kind of issues of history and morality trump um, issues of geopolitics. And that was, in effect, McDonald's view. I want to ask you, just to take you away for a second from your book, uh, after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, the British took the area of power. There was a big question about who created the, way the, the word Palestine. Do you have any history about it? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the... Who created the word Palestine? The name Palestine. Oh, the name Palestine. Yeah, it's a Roman. It was basically to humiliate the Jews after the destruction of the Second Temple. So it was a Roman word. I mean, how would you awaken people to see the Jews as Palestinian people before the word settlement was created? Uh, well, uh, Palestine was a, uh, a province or a, a segment of the Ottoman Empire. So there was something that was a Palestine, and it was ruled separately under the Ottomans uh, before the British got a mandate over Palestine. It's interesting, by the way, if you look in the 1920s, many of the Jewish immigrants call themselves Palestinians who are in Palestine then. So it wasn't clear. It wasn't. It wasn't clear that it was an only Arab. That uh, term at in the 1920s and 30s. It changed, of course, later. But some of the immigrants who came would call themselves Palestinians as well. Um, yes, Marion? Hello, thank you. Um, I have a question, and Richard, you just used the word moral, so that was that's where I'm going to hang on to that. Um, so the British and the Americans, you made both made the point, are allies. But Allies can also be rivals. And the British had really important geopolitical and economic interests in the Middle East. And I'm wondering, no one has said anything. You, you've raised the issue of Jewish pressure in the United States, and you've raised the issue of history and morality. But I'd like to know if the Americans in this period of the 40s were also interested in oil, in geopolitics, in getting a handle on the Middle East, getting in there as well. So that's the first question. And then the second is very different. It's the question of Zionism among, oh wait, there's one other part of the American issue, which is um, the Americans didn't want all these displaced people. And we know that from the 48 and the 51 you know, immigration laws. They didn't want them. So another uh, motivation might be send some of them to Palestine so we don't have to have the pressure in the United States of taking in more immigrants. 
because the United States didn't become non-anti-Semitic overnight either. So I'm curious about that. In, in other words, U.S. motivation. And then the second thing was that, um, and now you all, especially Michael, you know this better than I do about the DPs, but when surveys were taken of the DPs about who wanted to go to Palestine and did everybody want to go to Palestine? It was like 99% wanted to go to Palestine, but then only about 50% ever did. And if they got to go to the United States, they went to the United States. So I think that the, I at least this is what I've always understood, that the ideal of a Jewish state, that the utopian notion of a Jewish state was very important to everybody, but that they didn't really tell the truth. They didn't really all want to go to Palestine. So I just wanted to raise those two issues. Take another uh, question, and then. Um, my name is Jeremy Smith. I'm a student at Professor Brenner. Um, so I had a question. Obviously, um, McDonald has kind of been presented as a hero throughout your book. Um, seems to be more or less. Um, and then the Morrison Grady Committee has been, you know, presented as being very bad. But I was just wondering about what besides their conclusion. Um, kind of makes the Morrison and Grady committee illegitimate and their conclusions, um, you know, not worthy of consideration at the time. You're asking what was wrong with the Morrison Grady plan? Uh, it was a plan for establishing isolated Jewish cantons in Palestine, uh, not even contiguous territory, um, and it really had. You know, the, that committee was established under the pretense that it was a way to carry out the Anglo-American Committee report, and it wasn't. It was a different plan. Now, there are people, including uh, someone who's written a book recently who takes that plan uh, seriously and said, hey, it has a lot to recommend it. It was would have kept uh, some sort of binational state, um, but the whole purpose of the Morrison-Grady plan was to undermine the earlier Anglo-American Committee report and to come up with something that the British government found consistent with its imperial interests. And the State Department people who went to London and participated in that, that, that was fine with them. Uh, it wasn't fine with McDonald. So whether you consider that heroic or not, um, it, uh, that was the kind of dynamic that played out. Uh, let's go back to uh, Marion's questions, if I can remember them. Um, so um, moral issues versus geopolitical issues, I remember that. Um, we're, I, I guess we need to define who we're talking about when we say the Americans. So I mean, for the most part, we're talking about the committee and then its interaction occasionally with the State Department, but uh, usually going around the State Department and dealing with the White House. And the committee was not really calculating, you know, oh, uh, the Arabian American uh, company has important interests in Saudi Arabia and, um, you know, we need to take account of the oil situation. The committee just wasn't composed of that kind of a people on the American side. So uh, was the State Department interested in that stuff? Of course they were. Uh, in fact, and there were State Department people and uh, some intelligence people, OSS people, uh, who went to work for Aramco and uh, you know were uh, active in Middle Eastern politics. So we're not saying all Americans good, all Brits bad, and so forth. We're just telling you what the role of this particular committee was and what the attitudes of the committee members were. Um, I guess I want to say also that um, this um, committee really did change over time. McDonald was a tiny minority at the beginning and the more places the committee went, the more supporters he had. And so there's a process of education that takes place, and then a process of confrontation and education that takes place within the committee, as sometimes this happens even in academic uh, committees, 
And uh, then, um, you know, then the governments had to deal with something that was not so easy to ignore. I, I, I know you asked more than that, but maybe Norm remembers the rest. Immigration to Israel, or I immigration to the U.S. and Israel. Right, right, right. Um, well, of course, all of this is true. Um, it's good to see you, by the way. It, um, it, it, all of this is true, as you know, um, that uh, the uh, Immigration Act wasn't passed until 1948, and even when the Immigration Act was passed, um, you know, there were there were certain things in the act uh, that, that were designed to keep Jews out. I, I think this is one of those cases, though, where chronology really matters. Um, in 1946, and, and this is early 1946, uh, things look a certain way to Jews in Europe. Um, you still have Jews streaming um, out of Poland, Romania, and Hungary who have just discovered um, not only are they not going to get whatever property they once had back, um, but that their lives were in danger. They were looking for a place where they would be safe. Even the US was not trusted. And that what they keep coming back to is a country of our own, where we are the majority, is the only place where we'll be safe. Two things happen in 48, of course. You know, One is the DP Act in the United States, which allows um, uh, DPs to come to the US. The, the other is the founding of Israel, but Israel is a war zone. Um, you could not, with the founding of Israel in, in May of 1948, you could not just hop on a boat and go. Um, the UN was doing everything it could to slow immigration. In fact, even, even Jews that the British had been holding at Cyprus for, for many months could not just go to Israel. Um, uh, Count Bernadotte, the UN mediator, was trying to keep military age men out of Israel, and so one could simply not go. When immigration was more free-flowing in 1949, then the prospect was uh, going to a place that was at war, that had shortages with everything, um, including you know housing, clothing, shoes, you name it, or going to the United States where you could um, set yourself up immediately. And so I, I think part of this is the world, you know, there's so much more work to be done on this, you know, and, and it has political implications for today and everything. But I, but I think at, at the nub of it, the world is just a very different place to all of these um, DPs in, in 48 than it is in 46. One more quick point, uh, speaking of uh, implications for today. There is uh, a recent uh, current of literature which attributes uh, a lot of influence to the Jewish lobby and Jewish pressure on Truman, and some of it is uh, unflattering to the Jews, and some of it is unflattering to Truman, who only acts according to electoral uh, interest. Um, I just want to point out that this committee played a critical role, and you had 12 people, one of whom was of Jewish descent, and that was certainly not James G. McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to very briefly relate to one of the points you made, Marianne, about the 99% of DPs who, when asked, and there, there were these polls, and they would say, we want to go to Israel, actually, they would say often, and not just Palestine. Yeah, clearly that was a political statement. That didn't mean they all when they had the choice, would actually go to the Jewish state. They would go to America, to Australia, to South America, sometimes just as far away from Europe as they could after what they had gone through. And I think it shows us also something as historians, how careful we have to be with these with data. Uh, it's a little bit like I'm in the 1920s in Poland, um, there, there, there were in the census people asked, what was your native language? And we have, I think up to like 15, 18% of 
um, Jews who say Hebrew. And we know there were hardly any Jews. It was, but it was a political statement. These were the Zionists who would say, that's our native language. So that doesn't mean they really grew up with Hebrew in, in, in Poland or uh, around the turn of the century. I think um, we really have had a uh, um, very informative and, and, and enriching conversation um, about what was the prehistory of the State of Israel. And I can only recommend um, to get more of it. The books are out there, and you're welcome to purchase them. It is really a first-rate prehistory of the State of Israel from different sides, the British, the Americans, but also, uh, of course, the Jews, the Zionists especially, um, who would later form the first government of the State of Israel and many others. And um, my thanks go to the editors um, who are working to finish, I think, the fourth volume by the summer, and then we'll hopefully see each other again next year, whenever the book is out. And thank you to the audience for your questions and comments. <laughs>